Friends, welcome back to the Strong Life Podcast. This is episode 256 with Richard Pops Soren, the founder of Sorenex, an original Jersey boy. And we're going to try to do something very unique and get some regular conversations, interviews with Pops on Iron History. And so, Pops, first off, welcome to the Strong Life Podcast. You and I did a interview slash thing like this before there was such a thing as podcast maybe 15 years ago on grip training absolutely we go way back on a on a phone we did it on a landline phone <laughs> yeah a lot of a lot of what a lot of iron under the bridge 100 <laughs> percent. so in this episode i have you know for many years started researching phil gripaldi i, I don't recall exactly where i first came across him but I remember seeing his physique, hearing that he was from New Jersey, unfortunately hearing, you know, sometime before 2010, he had gotten arrested. He was a silver medalist uh, in the world championships, Olympic weightlifting. And I always say, man, like, how did our country not help this guy or get him involved in coaching? And so I came across this old article I'm going to put it onto the video so the people watching can see. This is a 1966 Iron Man, and the article is titled The Boys from Belleville. And it's an article on Phil Gripaldi, who at the time was, I think he's a teenager in these photos. I'll be posting these photos for our listeners over at um, ZachEvanish.com. But he had, it says here, he had 20 inch, 20 inch arms at the age of 16. And he's training with a night, another guy. His name in here says Mike Guibillo, but I believe you say it was uh, something else, right? Guibliano? I, I thought it was Gubliano. Yep, Gubliano. And that area, Belleville, the boys from Belleville, was about 10 minutes from Hillside where you grew up, give or take a few minutes. But um phil gripaldi arrested you know in and out of you know uh jail mike guibliano died in prison he got tangled up with the mob and uh, that area pops that you grew up in I, I knew a guy i wrestled with who also got involved in the mob that north jersey area was a hub for that and then when i read it i said wow pops was able to get out of that place it's not a I, I hate to say that's not a good place anymore. That Belleville area, Hillside is really tough where you grew up. Very tough area. Well, uh, on a two-edged sword, in that area where I grew up, it was extremely tough. The surrounding town, towns and cities like Newark, Elizabeth, where I used to work out uh, at the Elizabeth YMCA with uh, some pretty famous lifters, uh, uh, Tony Dottillo, who developed power rack training, things like that. These were my training partners. Uh, I lifted for the Keysby Eagles, Yes. which uh, Butch Toth was the coach. And it was, I'm trying to think exactly where it was. I know <clears throat> the building was under the bridges, Raritan Bridges, I'm not sure. But we used to drive there a couple times a week to train. And Phil trained there as well. Um, I, w I was a, a big admirer of Phil. His arms were bigger than any picture could show off, especially his triceps were uh, totally amazing. Um, he, he was a quiet guy, nice. Um, it turned out that even later on, when I caught up a little bit, I lifted against him. He just bar barely beat me in the snatch uh, at this uh, collegiate nationals. Uh, uh, Mark Cameron was there and he said, well, that was the only time I got beat in a snatch. And then he was just one of the first uh, Americans to clean a jerk 500. So I was kind of proud to be in that, that circle. Oh yeah. But it was, it was a place that you had to decide what, how you were going to grow up on, on, we had a private gym that's, that a, uh, one of my friend's uh, parents decided they were going to devote the whole basement to us building a homemade gym. 
And on that one street where the Cedar Street Boys grew up, I, I saw things like mob murders. I saw John Grimmick lived on that street for a while, two doors down. There was a famous uh, one of, uh, uh, Al Urban, who was one of the greatest physique um, uh, picture uh, artists, lived three doors down. We had the gym in the basement. We had about 25 members. It, it, it was 35 cents a month, which was a lot of money back then. Wow. What year was this, Pops? The, this was Round about 60, uh, 65 through uh, 69. Uh, we had uh, uh, some pretty fa not famous guys back at the time, but we had some known Olympic weightlifters come by and lift. It was, it was a little hub that, that I learned a lot about building equipment. Uh, and between there and the Elizabeth YMCA, which was a whole story in itself, which was uh, Elizabeth was a rough place. Still On a Saturday morning, we would get up early. Yeah. We would walk five miles to the Elizabeth YMCA uh, un -air, no air condition, no windows, uh, slimy green, lime green walls, dripping sweat, oak, uh, oak beams on the floor for a platform. They still had globe barbells. Uh, Anthony Dottillo worked out there, Dezo Van. Or Dave Draper. His, his real name was uh, Desi Van Locke. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was on the Hungarian Olympic weightlifting team. And these and Dave Draper trained with them. Uh, these were all just guys that, after work, would come in dressed kind of like I am right now, and maybe take the flannel. They, they probably, most of them worked out in flannel shirts, really. Yeah. And, and what they worked out worked in that day is it was their costume. It was no getting pretty or taking a shower before or after training. It was going in there and banging iron. And, and when you came into a gym in those days, you had to earn your place. I mean, if there was a guy that you were competing against, spotted you and you walked in, they might just pack up and leave. Just, I mean, it was a different day back then. And the opportunities, I often think that I was very mechanically inclined and I loved lifting and that wanting to be around those people of strength kept nudging me in that direction until I got a break with the scholarship, but to, to leave New Jersey. Right. And I, I don't know if right now I would be retired. Probably I would have worked in, in let's say machine shop as, in the tool and die room and, and retired at what they call the shore, of course, you know, the shore. Yes. Or the beach. But I would probably be retired now living okay. <clears throat> but the way my life fell in, and there was definite moments that people that didn't have to come into my life or help me stepped up and inspired me enough to move on or move away. When I left, when I left home, I had a spaghetti pot and I had a stack of strength and health magazines under my arm and I left home for South Carolina at the University of South Carolina. For so, throwing, right, Pops? You were for throwing? Yeah, I was a thrower. Yep. And, and it was just by chance, I was supposed to be cut that day because I was, I was a freshman trying to throw the javelin and I didn't know which end of the javelin to throw. I was walking <laughs> off the field, and as I walked off the field, and they were going to cut a number of people the next day, there was a senior standing there throwing the discus, and I'd never seen a discus thrown before. He said, come on over here, and seniors never would talk or, or let them sit with them at lunch or anything with freshmen, and somehow they befriended me and encouraged me enough where I saw value in it, and from then on, when I put my mind to it, when everyone else was doing what they were doing, I was out shoveling snow, throwing a discus out in the park next to my house. So it, it's, you, 
you, you have luck, but you make your own luck. Or when that step, that crux in the road comes up and you take the right turn, your whole life and existence changes. Yes. Yes. So Pops, what high school did you go to? Hillside? Hillside High School. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't even know if they have a high school. It's right next to Irvington. Um, Hillside's a real tough area now. You mentioned Elizabeth. I have heard stories of that Elizabeth YMCA and Dave Draper going there. And I believe also Jersey City was such a hub. Didn't Armin Tanny have put up like one of those kind of posh gyms in Jersey City as well? Were you around at the time? I, I know I know of his name, but I never I never went by there. I was uh, like I said, the Cedar Street place we had. Uh, a lot of the, the, the designs I use today started out because Papa Joe, the, the father of uh, my buddy that we trained with, yep. was a construction guy. And he would come back and bring us pieces of wood or pieces of metal. And we would figure out how to make platforms, power racks. Uh, he, 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 he built a bench one day to sit and eat lunch on, out of scraps. And I, I saw a guy bench 500 off that wooden plywood flimsy bench. It was hardcore stuff. And uh, it, it, it was a whole different world. It, it really was. Where, where did you pick up your weights? Did you road trip to York Barbell? Now you have to realize- or I was Jackson, up, Jackson Barbell oh, was Jackson, in the area. 17 Bryan Avenue. He, my dad would take me there on Saturday mornings. Yes. And I would pester Andy Jackson. And I, I would save all my lunch money and I would buy, I don't know, maybe 80 or hundred pounds of plates There were I think 10 cents a pound. And I would, I would stay there and look at all the things he was working on. Out of his I, house, I, right? I, I see him and, and actually watch him do his magic live. And I was just a kid or I would burr barbell was in Lyndhurst, which was 10 miles away. And I got to find out, you know, and watch them do the casting processes. What kid would they let in a foundry, you know, unless my dad basically begged him to, to, to let my son see this, because he's interested. I would get on a, a, a train 190 miles to, to York on Saturdays and, and watch them train in the York gym and I was 12 or 13 years old. I'd find, I'd walk off the train. I'd go to uh, find a, a motel at 12, 13 years old. I let me check. <laughs> and I would, I would go. I knew the famous lifters would tra uh, would eat at the uh, York Diner, so that's where I would eat. People like Sergio Olivia was there. Norbert Shemansky would eat there. Tommy Kono, Tony Garcy all these famous guys you read about, I got to be around them because yeah. the passion was there early and it, it would just draw me in those directions. You know, I, I, I just truly loved it. It's like seeing your superheroes in real life. Yeah. <clears throat> what about Pops? You know, if we back up, you know, a, accumulating uh, weights, building equipment, um, I recall you talking about the squat rack that was built in that Cedar Street house. Was it a wooden squat rack or you and I spoke about this so long yeah. ago? We still have pictures of it. They, they allowed me in school shop class to build power racks for underneath the school, which probably are still there because it was in the fallout shelter that was popular back in the 60s and whatever, yes. uh, uh, 50s and 60s. But uh, the, the power rack, it, all of them were narrow, okay? They were, they were drill pipes that York came out with, and they were, they were narrow. Meaning like the isometric rack that was so close yeah, together? Yeah, yeah. And then people only used it for isometrics, which was a cover for steroid use in the day. Oh, that's right. That's why a guy would go up 150 pounds on his total and I'm sitting there scratching my head wondering, well, I was as strong as him six months ago. Now he's a hundred pounds ahead of me. It was the beginning of D-ball, I think. 
yeah or for them ex experimenting with that i think <clears throat> you would know more did bill peanuts west cut the york isometric rack and open it up to squat inside of it and re, re weld it was that him that did that I, I don't recall that he w was responsible for doing that. When I trained, and the boy I got, I almost got jumped over it. Uh, when I, I was starting to learn how to do different things in metal crafting and welding and stuff, I started very early with that. At the Elizabeth YMCA, everything was ancient. I mean, it was, but everyone used it. A bench was set height, narrow, and a guy would have to do a half rep just to get the, the weight off. And the same thing with the power rack. Well, I convinced them, and I don't know how I did it as a teenager, could I rework the equipment where it would be adjustable, more stable, safer, all the above? Well, I was given permission to do it. So I would take a piece every week home and rework it. And when I brought the, that stuff, I widened the power rack uh, so we got so much more out of it than a little narrow thing. Same thing I did at the Cedar Street Boys. I made it where you could train inside or outside of it. It's, it was wood. Uh, the, the bench press was, was terrible, but everyone was used to that bench press. Well, when it was wider and adjustable and it had hook, uh, the hook was extended in the back where they wouldn't drop it on their face like normal. I was so dangerous. literally hung over at this. I mean, they hated my being for messing up their bench. Well, as soon as they started using these new upgraded things, they, they loved it. So I saw that progress needed to be there, but it was so hard to change people's minds because that's what they were used to good, bad, or indifferent, that was it. Those benches were so dangerous with oh. <clears throat> narrow. <clears throat> if you didn't have a partner loading the weight at the same time, <clears throat> the bar could flip. All the above. Yeah. And then, like you said, uh, one area to rack or unrack it, if you're exhausted, now you have to kind of do a half rep and then go backwards with it. It was oh, brutal. The power, the, the power <clears throat> was so narrow you could only do you could you could take the weight off but there was no safeties there was right. no way to have any support to do partials anything like that so when i made it wider anthony detillo started doing all his power rack training with the y and if you could look up some of the stuff uh that anthony uh posted back in iron iron man and yes. uh, some of the other magazines of the day you probably see that rack that I widened. Oh, I've got his book, so I'll look through it. And I've actually been a little bit in touch with his son. His son is, you know, powerlifting, but lifts I'm out of his his son right now on, on my uh, yeah. myself. I got to actually meet him. I, I I was at the nationals, and they called out Anthony Dottillo, and I, I went into shock because right. I know I knew that he had passed. Yeah. And his son is was a spitting image of yes. him walking out on that stage. And I didn't realize sitting next to me, this gentleman that was very, very quiet, never said a word, had a cane, turned out to be my coach, Desi Ban. Oh my gosh. He had a stroke and he didn't remember me. And finally, everyone got together and explained who I was and this, that, and the other. And then he remembered and a tear came down his, his cheek. I never forget that. Well, um, Pops, if you recall, I had came across that, you know, old school blog with Des Oban and I sent it to you. We don't know who the guy is, but he reprints all of these articles. I remember sending it to you and you're like, that was my coach. It says, I have one eye and you are nobody is like the title of the blog, but he reposts yeah. it. The, it's called Des Oban, Des Oban blog well, spot. If you look at it closer, it says the tight tan slacks, slacks that's it. of Dezo Band. And the yeah. story behind that is he always wore the same sweatpants and I never saw him in anything else. And I came home one afternoon and they had a surprise birthday party at my house and Desi was wearing tight <laughs> tan slacks. 
<laughs> we took a picture of him because yeah. no one ever saw him in anything That's except funny. sweatpants that were worn in the front right through from doing pulls that and is he wore a brown shirt all the time and, and gray sweatpants so no hardly anyone would ever know what that story was yeah um what it was and i still have the picture of him in those tight tan slacks for my in, party. so as i'm looking at this article pops it's all photos of phil Gripaldi training at the keysby i'm pretty sure he's at the keysby eagles barbell club in this these photos yeah. it's all standard weights so was jackson only making standard plates when uh no, when you were visiting we had the olympic plates there it's very difficult you know some people are there's a lot of people now collecting you know that stuff and you don't find too many of the olympic jackson bars and i didn't know that burr barbell was from Linhurst. and so if i look on the facebook marketplace or craigslist in new jersey area now i know why that stuff continues to kind of float around in our in the new jersey yeah. area yeah what why do you, you know keysby area i don't know if it was in belleville but where i grew up in edison close to fords and perth amboy there was an area called keysby was where keysby relocated that's why yeah okay and so john grimmick was also from originally from perth amboy yeah <clears throat> said he lived on the street we trained on when he yeah. was 16 and where was that hillside he trained in hillside that's or he lived in hillside he lived there for a while yeah and al urban the the gentleman i mentioned that was the uh, uh and you'll see urban on a lot of old pictures physique pictures okay he was the guy that that took the first pictures at 16 or 17 of john grimmick gotcha why do you urban. look that one up i will i'm i take notes when i do these podcast pops why do you think, you know, uh, Gripaldi and Guibliano, they, you know, Guibliano seemed like he was that big, you know, there's, I've been to many gyms where there's a big guy who's 6'6", 275, doesn't want to compete, doesn't want to be a powerlifter, bodybuilder. They're just kind of, they look the part, but don't compete. But why do you think those guys were not able to keep the straight and narrow path you know, you, you got out. Um, luckily you got out. That's a tough, real tough area still. Oh uh, God. Yes. It, 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 it's really who you associate with. Mm -hmm. uh, Gugliano, I, I think I, I, I didn't meet him officially, but I saw him one time and he had huge arms on him. He looked like kind of like a little bit smaller Chuck Aaron's. Oh, they they said 23 they said Mike has 22 inch arms. Oh, they were huge. They were, <laughs> they were. But, you know, if you hang around with a bunch of tough guys, right, you're going to get around things that are going to probably move you over the line a little bit law wise. Um, there was a, a, a lot of crime. Like I said, I, I saw a guy get dragged in a house and killed when I was young on the street we worked out on. Yeah. So it, it was a tough place. The town I grew up in was as good as it gets. It was a, it was a self-contained community surrounded by the toughest towns in New Jersey. Yes. So we never really, other than don't walk into the YMCA on Saturdays, we never really ranged out to Irvington or any of these other places at all. Right um <clears throat> speaking speaking of the training and uh what pops you went to university of south carolina for physical education yes so so gripaldi went to montclair state and i think that's what was his his degree was in i think so you started um you were a teacher correct for a few years yeah about seven years yeah seven years see i read when we were both in college this is when I ran into Phil at the Collegiate Nationals in, in Olympic lifting. I believe it was in New York. 
And so what, what uh, did you chat with Phil where he discussed any training? Because when you, this magazine, he was training very much like a bodybuilder. And it's, what's interesting is the mobility. When you have such big arms, usually that it works against you in being a great weightlifter. It, it didn't, it didn't really help him. Okay having arms that big, except it's in the press and they, they deleted that. And Correct. Too. But he was, he was short. He looked like he was, he looked like he was wearing shoulder pads and had hams hanging off his, his shoulders for arms. He was, they were so impressive and he was so proud of them. And so <laughs> much, and he looked up to Gugliano and he wanted to be a, a smaller you know, I guess copy right. uh, his hero. Uh, and if you look at the weights he actually lifted, he was very good. Yes. But you look at some of the Russian weightlifters later on, they were doing 100 pounds more than he was in both lifts. So it, it, when the press was there, I, I'm not think, I'm not sure if he, he set the world's record one time or at least the American record in the press, 374 keeps coming to mind. And I remember when we, we later on lifted, you know, we were close in, in the snatch and I, I cleaned about as much as he did. I think a little, little bit, 10 pounds less. So he was a very good lifter, but I, I don't think his arms helped him too much, especially when the quick lifts were, were used and the press went away. Right. There's video footage. Somebody who used to train at that Keysby Eagles weightlifting club put up, has up an old website and you could see some old video footage of them lifting. And it's interesting when they do the clean, they don't really come up to a great rack position. They almost do like a muscle clean. Just, yeah. they just powered it up. I remember back in the day when we competed, you could not touch the bar to your legs. I didn't know that. Right. Okay you had to lower the bar under complete control. No dropping. You could not drop it. And dro lowering a clean and jerk down and then lowering it, touching it to the floor was a whole other exercise that we've lost today. Somebody because once dropped the, they just walk away from it. Right, somebody so once told me that is why. It was a different thing. Do, do you um, feel that's why the lifters back then were so thick because of always doing the negatives and not dropping? Well, everything they did, they did a negative. Right. You know, and, they lowered and, the statues, they had to lower the clean and jerks, they had to lower the presses, all that stuff. And a lot of crossover, like you got Tommy Kono, who's bodybuilding and weightlifting. Uh, Some of these guys would powerlift and be weightlifters. So what are some of the big, um, oh, one, one more name pops <clears throat> that I read a story about and I wish I could, I'll have to re, re find it. I, I may have found it on that Dezoban website. The guy, JC Heiss, he had supposedly traveled on a train to come in and visit um, Andy Jackson. And there was a story of him he comes to Andy's house after being on a train for a day, like a, like a freight train, not an actual like uh, train for people. He cleans out his eyes, he gives them food. And then JC Heist goes to his basement and deadlifts like 760 pounds after not really training it. Do you know that name or did you ever meet him? Oh, absolutely. I actually have one of Heist's last Olympic bars that he ever, uh, I guess not sold, but had made or made himself. Now his son, lifted as well okay bob heiss okay jc and, had passed away at a young age correct in his 30s maybe maybe i'm wrong i i i know his son i remember in my mind a picture of him cleaning 415 as a teenager but uh heiss were they they were well thought of they i think they had uh the brand maverick Maverick plates. I didn't know. Okay. Early upper plates. And uh, you got to remember, Andy uh, Jackson International was a large old house that trucks would pull up and 
they had a coal chute that they would slide 40,000 pounds of plates down those that coal chute. In and his house? One by one would, would take them, bore out the centers, finish them off and put them on a stack. You go in there and it was just like stacked to the ceiling in this entire giant basement. And he said the, the highway department wanted to, to go through his property and they were forcing him to sell his house and he refused. Which he was said, Springfield, well, I'll New Jersey. In the house while you bulldoze it down, but I'm not going to sell it. So he was, he was a, and he was a tough old bird now. It was in the basement of his residential home, correct? Correct. Wow. And that wasn't actually a place you should be producing the stuff, I right. guess. <laughs> Zoning, you know, zone for it. But they wanted that property to put a highway through. And right. he, he refused to his dying <clears throat> day to let him do it. The, I've seen photos of the house. And for people listening and watching, Springfield is off of Route 22. It's near our, uh, I have a gym in Scotch Plains. Pops, do you remember a place when you grew up, uh, it was called, uh, it was in Scotch Plains on Route 22, it was an amusement park. Right. Uh, oh, Bowcraft. Oh yeah, I, go, I would go there all the time. Pops, my gym is, well, Bowcraft was sold, the, they sold it like uh, two years ago, and it's now gonna be condos. The gym that I have is right next to the old Bowcraft. Bowcraft used to have a little lake that I used to rent a canoe when I was a kid <laughs> and row back and paddle back and forth across there. And Bowcraft was owned by a gun shop named called Ray's, which was uh, in Scotch Plains. I've I've gone to Ray's. Ray's is no longer there either. Ray's was my favorite place, but it was my heaven to go there. <laughs> uh so it's a yeah. smaller world than you think. They must have retired, you know, sold everything, retired. Bowcraft had a lot of property. And so they're building, you know, condominiums, probably made millions upon millions for it. Some, some good stories. You might look up a very famous discus thrower, Art Swartz, S-W-A-R-T-S. He was from Scotch Plains. He was a teacher in Scotch Plains. He was the one who recruited me to come to South Carolina. And he was a great discus thrower. He threw well over 200 feet. He was an Olympic caliber athlete. Um, huge, strong guy. I mean, I, I saw him. He couldn't squat 135. But I saw him do uh, bent lateral raises with 80s, 80-pound dumbbells. Cool. So he was he was like a barrel on two two stilts. Why would he, what, did he not train certain lifts where he was so strong in one and it throwing that far? It was a law. He, he was, he was built to be a discus thrower. Right. And he didn't especially care to lift. Interesting. Except he could lay down and like I said, do 80 pound laterals, which no one could do. Or you know, I, I never saw him bench, but I'm sure he could bench close to 400. Uh, but he was someone who's Olympic caliber as like Al Order or the, the best in the world at that time. But he was from New Jersey and he came to my house and he said, this is a great place to go to school, this, that, and the other. And he, he's the one that kind of sold me on, on going to South Carolina because I had scholarships offered. Uh, I didn't have a background uh, in uh, college prep. So if I, I passed the entrance exam, I had a scholarship. If I didn't, I'd still be working in a factory. Wow. Amazing so, yeah. to get out of New Jersey, which is <clears throat> South Carolina is a world apart from New Jersey, I feel. Very it's different. It's not even on the, the same way. <laughs> Especially when I, when I arrived here, yeah. how far apart it was. It was I can like, imagine. Yeah. Not, not at all, you know, not at all developed, very country, right? It, it, it was, I was throwing 200 in the discus, and the state record here was 140. I mean, they, it, athletically, it was kind of set back. That's wild, because I always explain to people that the southern states, like the Carolinas, Georgia, you know, uh, Midwest, Texas, Florida, they respect strength at a, you know, there's been 
highly qualified high school strength coaches down in South Carolina and Georgia, where in the public schools of New Jersey, you know, I just got hired full-time in a public school. That is very rare for a full-time strength coach in a public school. Whereas down South, that was common. A couple of years ago, I was offered a job at a South Carolina high school and they were going to help me find housing. Years ago, people didn't know what a barbell was. I walked on South Carolina and the only thing they had at the whole university was one universal machine. And they had a barbell that I, I still have that was stuck where it was dropped out in the mud you know, I, I, on a practice field. And it was there. That was the only barbell on South Carolina campus. <laughs> University of South Carolina Athletics, that was it. What I brand? I with a shovel and dug that son of a gun out. What brand was that, that barbell? New York barbell. Of course. <laughs> it, was painted on, it was painted orange to make him hate Clemson because that was their rival. <laughs> so, who was a lot of memories there? Who became your mentor strength coach when you moved down to South Carolina, or did you just keep following Strength and Health magazine and the guys from York? Exactly. I, I followed the magazine. Desi would mail me my workouts. Uh, I still have his, his letters that he sent me. Uh, there was nothing here. The, the, there was nothing to speak of. A line, uh, when they tested linemen that weighed 280, 300 pounds, the first time strength-wise, the highest, the highest bench press by a lineman was 210. And they had one that weighed 300 pounds, and he bent, his highest bench was 160. Now, if you don't think that was in the dark days, down here, it was unheard of. Wow. The, the YMCA had weights here in town. Yeah. He would walk, oh God, I, that was probably three miles in between classes to go work out at, at the Y because that was our our play, our workout place. We didn't have anything at South Carolina. Right. Was every every wine say was York Barbell? Most of the stuff there, the the weight, the weight yes. things were was was York. York was so strong in the day. Right. You know, and that's what I grew up on. And that's you know, if it was a New York barbell, coaches didn't want it. But now, you know, it, it's changed a lot over the years. Sure. And I think when they when they lost their history, when Bob Hoffman passed and it went corporate, is when York had problems. Right. Because that uniqueness, that that passion, the York gang, the they had people that they sponsored lifting, working in the warehouse, touching the weights, being part of it. The York picnic was probably one of the greatest things ever held, which Summer Strong right. is, is showing honor to that. Yes. I would go there every year. We'd pack, in, we'd pack up in this old Ford and we burn five gallons of oil going to New York because it was so such a ratty thing. But we would go there and meet the, the the legends of strength were all at that picnic. Yeah, there's old video footage of <clears throat> John Grimmick lifting at one of the picnics. Oh, yeah. Did um... they, had, they had a stage and it was like all numbers. <clears throat> you just go up there and you show what you could do. Right. And someone threw a barbell down and pressed 300. Some guy come out of the audience and pressed 310. And <laughs> I, I saw some great battles. I saw Bednarski uh, against Bill March. Uh, head to head, and that was I, I still have a copy of that video, and uh, it was like electric. And he always based it around the senior nationals in weightlifting and powerlifting. So you would go up there, and it was a weekend event, it was like great. It's so I got a question for you then, Pop. So I've made some really <clears throat> close friends from Summer Strong. Some, one of the guys I speak with him on the phone every week. Um, did you meet, uh, make any like real long lasting friendships going to the strength and health picnics? Oh God, I mean, like I said, the, the people that were my heroes, yeah. 
knock on wood now are a lot of them that are still living are my friends. Yeah. And to see Wilbur Miller sitting right in front of you who just set the world's record in the deadlift. I was like, wow, you know, and, and, and how, or to have, uh, uh, Sig Klein and, and uh, all the greats line up for a picture and they were kind of like bumping shoulders because they were like bulls in a pen. They, they didn't want to be outclassed by the guy next to them. And I'm standing there with my little cube camera snapping pictures of it. Right, right. Things that forever I'll, I'll, I'll keep with me. <laughs> what about York was like an oil company, right? So wasn't there gym above the oil? Did you pick up oil to get yourself back home? They started out as York Oil Burner Company, <clears throat> yeah. which made castings, i.e. Uh, you, you can make weights out of right. the same stuff that the burners were made out of. But Hoffman really had the passion for the weightlifting, so it moved that way. He sponsored softball teams that did very well. He bought the park so that he could have events you know, and probably write it off or whatever. Sure. It, it was, Hoffman was something else. He really was. And every man has their high and low points, but some of the things he did for strength were, were so incredible. It was, it was a golden age yes. back in those days. It's changed today. Yes, 100%. Pops, what was the first piece of equipment you made down in South Carolina? Made in South Carolina? Yep. I, I was, I, I, I used the universal machine until I, I broke the pegs off the leg press. <laughs> <laughs> they got mad at me about that. And, um, I asked them, again, convinced them if we could build underneath the cafeteria, there was a storeroom under there, a wooden weight room. Wow. And that was, the, that, was the, that was the first weight room, I think, at, at South Carolina ever. And we would go under there after track practice or some of the football players would go down there. And I had power racks built and we had wooden incline benches and we had wooden flat benches and the basic stuff. I convinced them to buy some barbells. And then when I went to uh, uh, get my master's, they put me in charge of a P class to teach weightlifting. So they let me fund, they, they funded me. So I got all Ironman uh, uh, equipment. I got Alico barbells. I got <laughs> Russian Olympic sets. Uh, they backed me pretty well and, and lifting got on the, uh, curriculum in mainstream. Um, from what that. was this a high school, uh, phys ed or for like the college? Oh, they let me be a teacher, uh, at the university of South Carolina before I even had my teeth, my, <laughs> I even graduated. So you I had P184, I think it was. And was it athletes or was it just general students? You could sign up for the course. And we I, I gave them tests. We, I, I trained them every day. There's people that still contact me to this day. He said, I was in that class. And I remember the, the final question, bonus question was, what was the world's record in the squat? And it was 854 by George Friend. <laughs> He goes, I got that extra point. I got that extra point on the test. Um, that is amazing. So, Pops, the did you what did you think when you saw the muscle builder power articles in the late 60s that were from West Side Barbell and Culver City that I think arm uh oh crap, I'm forgetting his uh I'm forgetting his name. Those articles with all of the unique lifting so the you got you have to understand this that power lifting was well organized and started at zuber's gym right and and peanuts borrowed a lot of the equipment and ideas from zuber's gym yes somebody That's just sold 
their Zuver plates for a little over eight grand on eBay. I never would have sold them if I had them. Well, I have 12 pairs of them. I know. I don't know where, uh, I can't remember where the person was maybe, uh, I don't want to say possibly California, possibly Nevada, but I would never sell them. Somebody wanted to buy that 150 pound globe dumbbell that I showed you. And I said, I could never sell it. And he says, everything has a price. I go, I won't even sell it for $10,000. <laughs> I, I saw a pair of the, the 50 Zubers for 17500 <clears throat> $17, for sale. Now I have the 50s, the, uh, the 150s, and there was only eight made, but I have the 200s here. Yeah. I mean, unheard of. Right. Bob was an original frogman before they were called the Navy SEALs. Yes, he was. That's probably where he learned the welding, correct? He actually, his his son, Bob Jr., it was the one that did most of the, quote, donkey work, <laughs> painting the plates, doing the welding, doing all that stuff. I went out for a week and visited Bob Jr., a brilliant guy. Yeah nice guy and knows the history had thousands of pictures to look at wow um and just a just a wonderful link to that history the zoomers gym was probably the best the greatest most innovative gym ever ever made and I, that's the only thing i regret of all the places that i struggled to get to i never made it to the west coast and visited zoomers in, in its heyday I, I would fit within the age parameter, yes. but I, I just never made it out there. And um, why? Because of the distance to and from Iron Island. Yep. Contacted me first to see if I could rebuild things that were at Zoomers. And I said, look, I don't know the man, but I'm not going to copy someone else's stuff. So I saw, I'll bill you a super heavy duty lap form machine, but I'm oh. not the way he did it. Out, right. out of honor to, to another creator. But uh, Zoovers is really the key. They had a powerlifting, official powerlifting team. All the greats visited Zoovers gym. Right. They had um, everything <clears throat> bigger than life. They're, um, he, in a lot of ways, funded Peanuts West to start West Side. If you look at pictures of Peanuts West and Arnold, they're lifting Zuber plates. Yes. That they borrowed from him. Amazing. So, Just amazing. You know, powerlifting wasn't invented by Peanuts West. It was aided and embedded by sure. Zuber. And then Peanuts took it to another level and there's many people now that in West Side with, with Louie, who was a, a good friend for the, over the years, that don't even don't even know the name Peanuts West or why they have West Side tattooed on them. Yes, don't know the history. Was he doesn't like that when they don't know the history of wh where it started, where where it where it came from, and I think Zuver's original was also from his house, so it was on a residential street. That's where he got into a problem. <laughs> they, the parking yes. was excessive and people complained, so he finally had to shut that gym down. Right. And then he opened two bodybuilding gyms that didn't really- I heard, I read really, about it. Wasn't Some, really his thing. Somebody in Pittsburgh purchased the Zuverman, the big statue. Yeah. And got it. Yeah, and got the I statue. I to buy that, but I didn't do it. You re what was that? You regret regret not buying it, or I had an opportunity to right. buy that. Yes, but unless I could show it and put it in a place of honor, I I didn't do it. I I, I kind of regret it. Sure, I didn't do it at the time. Right, and it seems like after his gym shut down, I think Joe Weeder was gonna try to partner with him and wanted him to do like an all women's gym. It, it, correct, correct. They didn't get along too well. Right. And it's a lesson of, <clears throat> you know, for us guys like us pops, we're such purists with strength that when you veer out of what your heart tells you to, 
it's like you know getting hit in the teeth by a two by four you have to stay true to yourself absolutely what else do you have i mean you do you think strength was born yesterday <laughs> no there's a there's a museum full of stuff yes. on the other side of my wall that proves it wasn't That's and most right. of the ideas were there a hundred years ago yeah you, you it adds the, it's the other side of the story you need to know yes. or you're just doing pushing metal around you could be pulling stumps and it would make you strong barbells are just a convenient way to express strength and engage it and, and, and increase a bit at a time, which, which progressive training is all about. Yeah. So, uh, there's so, there, there's, it's so rich in our history. If you take the time to look at it. hundred percent. You, you mentioned Dr. Ken uh, about two years ago. I think I picked up a pair of iron Island plates, which I, I think I designed them and sold them to them. Oh, you did. I think there was four, how many pairs made? 400 or 200? I don't know, but I have a number out here. Yeah. The, um, so when he, the story behind them was <clears throat> he was no longer involved in Iron Island, you know, but I think Hurricane Sandy flooded Iron Island gym. And so the, that owner, his old partner sold off the equipment. <clears throat> Somebody had like 20 pairs and sold a bunch he may have had like eight pairs when i went and so uh i can't remember what i paid for the pair but he says i'll sell you know morty's i go uh my wife will kill me <laughs> that's be, been like there won't be any more back then york was really i'm trying to think of who was in charge of that but i had a struggle because universities were wanting to have uh, uh, logos on plates and no one did that. I finally, I think it was Vic Standish who it was. I finally talked him into doing logoed plates for me. Yeah. I, I would, I would buy the rights to the plate, design it, and they would cast it. And we did numerous and Iron Island was one of them. And they said that no, no one's going to want purple plates. I said, you got to have this on it and it's got to be purple plates. And I sold about four or five pieces to Dr. Ken when he opened. What What did he buy? Oh, he. I know what we built the lap machine for him. It was a 400 pound pull down lap machine. We did a couple other things for him. Uh, he He was always he was a rough and tough guy. Right. He was always a, ple a gentleman and a pleasure to deal with. Yes. And uh, he he was a searcher. He went to Zuber's and saw it. Yes. If you look up uh, uh, Zuber's gym on images on Google. You see him pressing you, the keg, the barrel. And people argue about it. Well, I know how much it weighs. You know. And, he was so strong for a lighter guy. Oh, yeah, he was. He was. He was game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? What about, we're going to close out soon, Pops. One of my favorite images is, I think, um, Jan Todd, dead rack, pulling all that weight on one of your early squat racks. <clears throat> she was she was exceptional, just by, by leverage or whatever, uh, in that particular lift. And she did what I gathered to be a, a thousand. Now, I don't know if she used straps or not. I don't recall. I, I'll look up the image. I'll share it on the website. But we would we would discuss that a good bit, and Terry was very proud of her for that. Because that that's that's a huge amount of weight. Yes. But uh, uh, and still to this day, a lot of people. We had a contest uh, about yes. a year ago. <laughs> I just really wondered what people could do. Was, I got thirteen thirty one barehanded, and I. I don't think anyone's even come close. Not that I, I not that I know of. And there have been. They, they <laughs> tried, but the you thing know. is, everyone today uses straps. Yes. What do you think about that? It's for the younger guys, right? We get. I started going hook grip. I'd say I'm 45, 
started using a hook grip around 41. My left bicep, you know, I don't, it's, it's probably got some slight tears to it. So I always hook grip. I never <clears throat> ever, I, I just didn't do it. I did use straps at times, but not always. When my grip was the least of my worries. Right. That lockout, I could, my, my human body couldn't move, have moved any more weight than that, but my hands held fine. It's, but now, if you notice, there's people missing deadlifts using straps and it's falling out of their hands. Yeah. So their hands are becoming weaker while their bodies are becoming stronger, which to me is a moot point because if you get in a contest where you really have to show your strength, if your hands are the weakest point, well, that's where your strength ends. Right. So I wouldn't say I would train all, I'm going I'm to train this afternoon, knock on wood, still going, <laughs> and use the same barbell, Jackson yes. barbell, as I did 50, almost 60 years ago. Okay. Like it's a, it has spinning collars, that Jackson barbell? It's called a number five, and it's a modified spinning uh, sleeve. But that's what I used when I did my first 500 pound deadlift for the next 50 years. Right. It's sitting right outside the window. They are ready for me to deadlift today on it. Yeah. So as good as the day I bought it. Um, just talking about that power rack, that was your power rack that uh, Jan was deadlifting on, that rack pull? It's like a blue. I don't, I don't recall it being mine. Maybe it's the photo of you. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be in the right time. Okay. It was probably earlier than when I was in business. The photo of you pulling, I believe, is on like a blue yeah, rack. A real... and I, I converted my garage into a gym. We even put an air condition in there. And we had some great lift. I did probably my best lifting ever in there. Um, Pop, so this, let's close out with that. Now with what happened with COVID and gyms limiting people, closing, it depends on the state. A lot of people went with the garage setup. What was your garage gym, the first one? What was in there? The first piece of equipment I ever built and where I lifted was my basement. And the basement was only as high, the ceiling was only as high as my head. So when I could deadlift, 400 pounds at 12 years old, I couldn't press probably a hundred overhead. <laughs> it was all back. Right. Uh, and I, I had a, a bench. I had a pair of squat racks that uh, were two upright pipes, uh, had very little, the basic things you could get 90% of the work done. You really, right. can't. you don't need a lot of fancy stuff. It's just a little bit more icing on the cake. Now, if you have the opportunity and don't spread yourself too thin, keep it simple, keep it basic, vary it up, you know, learn how to recover, different tempos, all those things are, are so important. Uh, I, I think the idea of pausing in the bench is a great idea. Right. Because that initial drive overcoming inertia makes you stronger. Very it's strong. More explosive. It gives you a lot of positive things. Lifting shouldn't be an easy thing. It mm -hmm. should be a difficult thing, but safe. And where you're not spending an hour putting your pants on or unloading or loading a weight. It should be simple to get to, safe to use, and real effective. High intensity, either by high reps or high weight. And it, it, it's a simple recipe if you follow it and it works universally for if you, if you do the work, it works. Now, Pops, what about describe the garage gym that you were just mentioning where you put the air conditioning in and had these best workouts in? What was in that garage gym? Oh, oh no, that <clears> was, <throat> I had uh, incline, uh, a really special incline bench that had a pad for a lumbar support. Yeah. No one has done ever since. Uh, I had a regular bench. I had, we had a Smith machine. We had a squat rack. We had a lat pull. Uh, we had a platform. Wow. Uh, several Olympic sets. A two-car garage this must have been? 
Yeah, yeah. And I converted the whole thing. <laughs> and it, it was nice. I mean, we we set it up really nice. Yeah. And the whole neighborhood com, would come, you know, creeping down the street at night. Yes. We'd go in there and train. How old were you when you set that up, Pops? Do you remember? Uh, see, I, that, I was uh, probably 19... 80 to about 87, uh, 88, somewhere in there. Yeah. Wow. The 80s. My, my heaviest lifting was training in there. I mean, it was, it was hellacious training. Yeah. <laughs> the, just brought you back to your roots of where you would train with, you know, up at the I Elizabeth YMCA. Back to the Cedar Street boys. Yes. Of what worked, but we made it better. That's, Amazing. that's what life is. You want to always make things better. You want to improve things. A power rack is not going to change for the next 50 years. Uh -huh. But the how it's set up, the things that you could do with it, the accessories to it is going to be the key. Because then training time is, is always an issue and space is always an issue. Oh, yeah. If you're real efficient with both, you can get better <clears throat> Also, the number of athletes in the weight room at once has just, you know, gone huge. So um, the high school I'm at, Pops, there would be times where I have 75 athletes with me. Right. <laughs> if you could set it up where you could save two minutes <clears throat> on each person's training routine yeah. by not having to walk around or unload or load a barbell, whatever, you're talking about 75 times two. Now you saved hours of training time that now you could apply to uh, uh, time under tension. Yeah, getting better, getting if, better. If you know how to deal those cards better and more yes. efficiently and safely, you win. Yes, it's uh, the captain of the ship. You know, you need a great captain to steer the ship. And so, um, the gym, the high school I'm at, Pops, I'm not sure they built this bubble 20 years ago, but there was loads of York barbell plates, um, some of those cheap TDS plates, which are really cool, <laughs> some Ivanko deep dish plates, which I know you love. And so oh, yeah. I give the kids a little history lesson all the time. And I say, well, they're like, coach, we get another story. I said, I don't give out these stories, guys. You got to earn them. So let's see how hard you work. And I might have a story for you. So it's always a story of guys, let me talk to you about these York plates or let me these Ivanko deep dish plates. And I tell them about the first gym I trained at. So pops, this was a great treat. It was just a great pleasure to do this with you. We're going to try to do this on the regular, you know, everybody watching and listening can go to sorenext.com. And, um, you know, I bought my first squat rack from Sorenex in 03. And then I traded it for another Sorenex rack from a guy who used to go to old uh, YMCA's, old high schools, clean them out and then upgrade them. And, but uh, I trade, I had a, I had the uh, half rack and you guys custom made it because my garage had low ceilings. So you cut the top lower and then you, the pull up bar was lower, but I said to Bert, I said, Bert, make sure that there's holes drilled at the top because when I get my gym, I'm going to move the pull up bar up. <clears throat> but the short of the story is uh, after I traded that first Sornex rack for the other one, yep. I got slightly depressed <laughs> because it was the first one. And I believe he donated it to a high school, but it had a very unique, custom color i told bert i love this like military green but i said i want you to do something special with it i'm not telling you how i'm gonna let you be an artist and do your thing and it had these like gold specks it was like a military green with gold specks and it was just a beauty <laughs> an absolute it's and now it's somewhere in a school hopefully where kids are just putting the work in it it was a tank i i could I could actually think back when I was working in the garage before it was a gym and trying to building stuff where I learned to weld out on my uh, carport yes. that drilling seven holes a day by hand 
to make a power rack, which I still know where it is. It's out there being used by some of the strongest people on earth. To this day, that hand drilled, handmade, hand welded, stick welded rack that I made, I can close my eyes and remember what a pain in the butt it was to make it. <laughs> Still out there servicing people and making their lives stronger and better. And Where I'm is it? That. Where is it now, Pops? I can't tell you. <laughs> Off air, perhaps, in a Maybe. parts unknown. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Pops, you know, Sorenex was the first equipment I got in my garage and still outfitting you know i've got two locations we're upgrading a current one with new sornex racks and um you know the goal from there is it goes with my kids so if, if where my it. kids go one day they get a sornex rack I love it. it's um it's been really special pops you know i've uh, known you guys since 03 when i started getting into everything so I'm looking forward to doing these again for the people listening. They can watch these on YouTube. You could go to sorenext.com. I'll be sending these videos to the tech guys, the media guys. They'll probably start organizing them. And of course, this will be wherever you could listen to podcasts. And Sornex has the Be Legendary podcast where you could listen to many great stories, educational, inspiring, history, everything. And um, Pops, I'll be seeing you at uh, Summer Strong. And also, by the way, Pops, my son has your same birthday, June 26th. We got to do something special about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I got to remember that. Yeah. I, I just want to challenge you. Yes. What are you going to be doing at four o'clock this afternoon? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm running. The iron. Yeah, we're trained. My gym opens at four. So uh, once we shut this down, I'm he I'm heading to my gym and doing my thing. There you go. Yeah, got to get it, got to get it done thing. to earn the weekend. So pops, stay on. I'm gonna shut it down again, everybody. Thank you, pops. Just stand by, my friend.